Good evening. Buenas noches. Thank you so much to the Internet Lab, to Dennis, Natalie, and your entire team for this very impressive event. And it is such a privilege and honor to be with you here today. It is my first time in Brazil, and it is beautiful and delicious food. Thank you. So I wanted to talk to you today about biometric cyber surveillance, or the mass surveillance and the integration of technologies that link biometric data with other data, such as your biographic data. And so uh, today I wanted to first talk about, in the United States, what they call extreme vetting. It is linked to what you may have heard of as the Muslim ban under the Trump administration, and use this as a case study to explain some other phenomena, including how mass surveillance is increasingly justified for national security purposes, what are the components of big data um, intelligence methods, and then what are some of the differences between small data surveillance and big data cyber surveillance, and how does biometric cyber surveillance impact the law and constitutional rights? So, Extreme vetting, um, it involves um, the mass collection of data in order to predict <coughs> risk. And under this prediction of risk, the um, government, the United States government, is making the um, program proposal that you can collect massive amounts of data that is publicly available through social media, and publicly and privately available databases and integrate that through algorithms and make an assessment of how to take action against individuals for vetting purposes or screening purposes, database screening, and right now they put it in the context of um, immigration in the United States. So um, the um, then candidate, um, President, now President Trump, but when he was a candidate, explained that he was going to initiate what he um, called uh, a Muslim ban, a statement on preventing Muslim immigration. That was in December 7, 2015. And he said in that statement that he was calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what is going on. Um, shortly before the election, he explained that the um, extreme vetting program was going to be used to implement the Muslim ban. It's also been uh, described as an algorithmic method of implementing the Muslim ban. He said that um, the Muslim ban is something that in some form has morphed into extreme vetting from certain countries of the world. So um, prior to this, the United States has already used social media in order to conduct vetting. Um, beginning in 2015, the Department of Homeland Security stated they used Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts for those prospective refugees, for example, from Syria and Iraq, um, in order to screen for risk. And the um, Department of Homeland Security then Secretary um, John Kelly stated that extreme vetting would include, for example, looking through telephone contact lists on smartphones as well as asking for passwords um, in social media accounts. Um, and then later on through media disclosures, it was revealed that the Department of Homeland Security had um, they had hosted an industry day to explain extreme vetting. Um, and they circulated a document called the Extreme Vetting Initiative to leading technology firms in the United States. Um, in one of the documents, they stated that they needed some type of um, automated tool in order to conduct these shifting and sifting through all of the data that was available on these individuals who might pose a risk to the United States. Uh, they said that the tool would automate, centralize, and streamline the current manual vetting process, which is a human-intensive process of looking through the records and the data in order to protect the interests, um, and that they would 
evaluate the probability of an individual of becoming a positively contributing member of society, as well as their ability to contribute to the national interest, and whether or not they intended to commit um, criminal or terrorist acts after entering the United States. And as a part of the tool, they said that the contractor shall analyze and apply techniques to exploit publicly available information, such as media, blogs, public hearings, conferences, academic websites, social media websites, such as Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, radio, television, press, geospatial sources, internet sites, specialized publications, with the intent to extract pertinent information regarding targets, including criminals, fugitives, non-immigrant violators, and targeted national security threats and their location. Um, during the Q&A session, um, there were those that asked, is this legal? And the Department of Homeland Security stated that um, the biggest constraint is that currently they are restricted to publicly available information. Um, they said, however, they needed to be nimble in order to get the job done. And they also concluded that they would do it until there was a law that told them that they could not do it. And that is the status of the law right now in the United States, that this type of mass surveillance, unless it is expressly prohibited, is not considered unlawful, especially when collecting publicly available data, such as social media data. Now, I give this as an example to set the stage for biometric cyber surveillance, because the executive orders that implemented the extreme vetting program and the Muslim ban, or also referred to as the travel ban, also required the collection of biometric data. And the White House executive orders in the United States also explained that there would be um, identity management systems that would be implemented in order to sort through the biometric data and the biographic data in order to assess threats. And this is the face of the future of biometric cyber surveillance. That in the name of national security and in the goal of predicting threat risks, there is the justification to collect more and more data and to build the algorithms and to build the artificial intelligence tools necessary to assess and analyze millions and billions of pieces of data on individuals once that data is collected. And the question now is to what extent is it legal? So in the United States, we do not have the right to informational self-determination. And my understanding is the Brazilian constitution does allow for the protection of data. We also in the United States do not have an omnibus privacy law that guides data protection in any comprehensive way. And so right now, under US law, when confronting these technologies of mass surveillance, there are questions to what extent the Constitution in the United States can protect against mass surveillance threats. You have the Fourth Amendment that protects against unreasonable searches and seizures without a warrant. You have the First Amendment that protects freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, for example. You have the Fourteenth Amendment. You have the Equal Protection Clause that protects equal protection under the law. You have the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment that protects due process under the law. And so, constitutionally, there are multiple ways that these surveillance technologies are being challenged. And then through other types of statutes, for example, many states in the United States are passing laws that protect against biometric data collection. But where there's a gap, there is a lot of unanswered questions of how to proceed legally. And so now I wanted to go to um, the next part of my talk, 
which are some of the justifications for um, cyber surveillance. So I wanted to talk about what is big data cyber surveillance, what are some of the methods used, and what are some of the consequences. So you might recall from the Snowden disclosures that there was one of the slides by the National Security Agency that basically said that the philosophy of collection of the NSA in the United States was collect it all. Collect it all is considered a horizontal scaling of data methodology, where you just collect any possible piece of data that might be available, and then you sort through that data and you make an assessment of the value of that data after the fact. But in the first instance, you collect it all. And part of the philosophy for this, the United States has explained, is because you, can't, you don't know, um, because you can't connect the dots that you don't have, it drives us into a mode of fundamentally trying to collect everything and hang on to it forever. Forever being in quotes, of course. And then this is the um, CIA Chief Technology Officer, Gus Hunt, at a presentation. He explained that it's nearly within our grasp to compute on all human-generated information. He said, it's all about the data stupid. Revolutionize big data exploitation. Acquire, federate, secure, and exploit. Grow the haystack and magnify the needle. So some people have explained that what this is is a put the haystack before the needle approach to national security and intelligence gathering that in a small data world, you started with the needle. But then in a big data world, you start with a haystack. You start with growing the haystack first. In a small data world, this was also explained by the CIA chief technology officer, you start with uh, the question, and then you move to the data. But he said in the big data world, everything has been flipped upside down. And you start with the data, then you move to the question. So what does that mean? In a small data world, you start with the crime, and you start with the suspect. Then you build the evidence after the fact. And so I'm sure that you're learning this methodology in law school. You first understand what is the question you're trying to answer, and then you ask, what is the evidence that I have in order to prosecute or order to build the case against that individual? In a big data world, it's been flipped upside down. And so through the eyes of the intelligence community and through the eyes of those in national security, in order to stop the next threat or in order to engage in pre-crime, in order to predict the crime before it occurs, you start with the data. Then you ask, is there a suspect? within the sea of data. You start with the ocean of data. You ask yourself, of the billions of pieces of data that is available to me to analyze, can I find a suspect or a crime in the data? So this has turned the intelligence community upside down. It's turned the method of intelligence gathering upside down. So Snowden, when he came forward, with the disclosures on the NSA program said, does this work? Is this constitutional? Or are we just growing the haystack of data bigger and bigger and bigger? And are we not able to find the suspect or the criminal or the terrorist in the ocean of data? And also, what has been revealed by this new system of collection of data is that Everyone is a target. Anyone who has digital data has become a target. So what this also means is that your phone, your laptop, any of your digital devices that is creating data on your behalf is becoming the suspect instead of an actual human being becoming the criminal. So part of what it, Snowden explained in an interview after the Snowden disclosures is what the NSA is asking is, is this phone suspicious? Not are you suspicious? Not am I suspicious? Not is a person suspicious? But the digital proxy that is creating the data, is that suspicious? And we also learned after the Snowden disclosures that the United States and their drone strikes were 
targeting suspicious data. And in what they were calling signature strikes, the United States admitted there were times they didn't know the person that they were targeting because they were targeting and killing suspicious data. So what one drone operator explained in an interview with The Intercept is people get hung up that there's a targeted list of people on the kill list. It's really like we're targeting a cell phone. It's not going after people. We're going after their phones in the hope that the person on the other end of the missile is a bad guy. And you also had the former head of the NSA and the CIA, General Michael Hayden, explaining we kill people based on metadata. Metadata is data about data. Data about data includes, for example, the time of the call, the place of the call, the phone numbers of the phone. It is not the content of the phone call itself. In a small data world, you relied on the conversation in order to gather the intelligence necessary in order to make a determination of whether or not you had a person who was a suspect or a criminal or a terrorist. Now, in a big data world, with big data cyber surveillance, metadata alone can be the justification for killing a target. So the place of a call, the time of a call, the metadata, becomes what is suspicious. And the proxies of data or the deliveries of the data can be the justification for killing individuals in the name of national security. So then I wanted to talk now about biometric cyber surveillance and a program that the Department of Homeland Security is test piloting called the Future Attribute Screening Technology. So under this program, <laughs> biometric data such as physiological cues um, can be used in order to make a determination of whether or not somebody is suspicious. So the physiological cues can be body and eye movements, eye blink rate, pupil dilation, body heat changes, breathing patterns, and linguistic cues such as voice pitch changes, alterations in rhythm of speech, changes in intonations of speech, etc. in order to detect what the Department of Homeland Security calls malintent. And volunteers who were asked to help test pilot the program explained that the consequences can range from none to being temporarily detained to deportation, prison, or death. And then the disposition matrix, which was also revealed shortly after the Stony disclosures, is a mapping of the disposition of terrorist suspects. Both FAST and the disposition matrix show that we are moving towards a collection of data, both biometric and biographic, that helps to justify, in the minds of the United States intelligence community, national security, and military, who might commit a crime in the future, who might be a terrorist in the future, and this is why I refer to it as pre-crime. That this is data that is being collected and analyzed in order to anticipate some type of future threat not a threat that is currently being posed right now. But whether the data shows that an individual in the future might be somebody that should be targeted. And one of the theories that explains this justification is the national surveillance state. The national surveillance state has been described by constitutional law professors in the United States, Jack Balkin and Sanford Levinson as one of the most important developments in U.S. constitutionalism. And they explain that it is a gradual transformation. It's a gradual transformation from the welfare state and the administrative state into a, a national security state and a surveillance state. And that the justification for the national surveillance state is to be protective. That in order to protect the interests and the safety of those in the United States, that the surveillance is necessary. The surveillance is a part of governance. It's not considered exceptional. It's not considered intelligence gathering. It's not considered even necessarily for criminal purposes. But the surveillance itself serves very basic administrative and governance goals. And so the surveillance is being integrated into the administrative state 
And then part of what they predict is that you will have a blending between national security law and criminal law in a way that is nearly invisible and seamless. That because the interests of the criminal law enforcement structure will be almost exactly aligned with the national security structure, you will have a blending of the laws and you will have law enforcement start to replicate through the technologies that they adopt, the same technologies that are being used by national security, intelligence, and the military. And then you will also have a secret criminal law formed in order to execute this type of surveillance structure. And that the criminal procedures they predict will fail. That all the legal protections that are built into the US Constitution to protect a criminal defendant will fail under the new theory of what they call the national surveillance state. So now I wanted, in my um, final minutes, to explain a little bit more about um, some of the justification for national surveillance, biometric surveillance, and how it's actually being executed in the United States. So in the United States, after 9-11, the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, increasingly there was a move towards biometric identification and identity management. And my understanding that in Brazil, there's been a very similar movement, including the adoption of a biometric national identification system. And in the United States, there has been active discussion on the adoption of a similar type of biometric identification system. This fits in perfectly with the theory of the national surveillance state because it is not considered exceptional or criminal or national security or intelligence. A biometric identification system then will complement identity management goals perfectly. So, after 9-11, there was the signing of a presidential directive of biometrics for identification and screening to enhance national security. They directed the military and federal government to collect, store, use, analyze, and share biometrics, and also to collect and analyze contextual information. So what is contextual information? Um, according to one executive, Contextual information is all locations you go, all the purchases you ever make, all of your relationships, all activity, all your health, governmental, employer, academic, and financial records, your web search history, your calendars, your appointments, all of your phone calls, your data, your texts, your emails, all people connected to your social circle, all your personal interests, and all other personal data. That is not the definition of the US government, that is the definition of a private corporation in the United States. But this helps to explain the Snowden disclosures and helps to explain this slide. This slide states that the responsibility of the NSA includes sniff it all, know it all, collect it all, process it all, exploit it all, partner it all. This is also a slide from the US government, from the Navy, what they call a social radar system, where you try to look into the future through the collection of mass data. It includes military, religious, political, economic, health data. It includes um, what they call sentiment analysis, which is the analysis of emotions, um, geography, demography, econometrics, and you'll see at the bottom, um, surveillance, that these tools are integrated in order to forecast and foreshadow future threats. You also have um, a program that um, the government used, government said was disconnected, but total information awareness, and that other experts said then were later revealed through the programs that the standard disclosures um, had demonstrated. But you see here, you start with the authentication of biometric data. That's in the top corner of the chart. You start with the authentication of biometric data. Biometric data meaning, for example, your face through facial recognition, fingerprints, uh, your uh, iris scans and your DNA. And you start with biometric data indicators that authenticate your identity. And then you move to other virtual data repositories, intelligence data, transactional data, such as banking data, health, education data, and then you come to some type of assessment 
of risk. And ultimately, um, this poses increasingly an Orwellian type of problem or a dystopian type of problem that some are fearing that falls outside the scope of the law altogether. That if you have a government that embraces pre-crime ambitions, what happens to the presumption of innocence? What happens to process under the law? If you are suspected of crimes before you have even committed them, if the data even seems to suggest that you might have a tendency or a proclivity or the possibility of committing a crime before that crime occurs, and if the government is able to take action against you, what does that do to the law? And increasingly under these identity management systems, or under the US military, they also refer to these systems as population management systems. What does that do to dignity and autonomy and some of the other core functions of a constitution that is intended to protect individual liberties, rights, privileges, and freedoms? And what we're seeing are the boundaries are collapsing. So the boundaries between what is considered truly private and what is truly public because of technology are collapsing. What is considered information that you intended to disclose to others or what information you didn't intend to disclose, that's collapsing. What is considered a domestic affair or a foreign affair is collapsing in light of the internet, in light of these technologies of mass surveillance. What is considered criminal law enforcement and what is considered military is a division that in the United States used to function to safeguard against what you could <coughs> draw a wall and a protection in criminal law but that's collapsing. And then what is considered content and non-content, those boundaries are collapsing as well. And so you have in the United States, courts more and more often invoking George Orwell in 1984. So in one Supreme Court case, um, a case involving warrantless GPS tra tracking in the United States, you have the Supreme Court and the uh, attorneys arguing the case referring to George Orwell's novel six times in the context of constitutional rights. And it appeared that they were reaching for a new way of envisioning rights and the law so that they weren't relying upon the actual law or jurisprudence, but they were actually relying upon an idea or a philosophy or an ethical norm that might not be captured by the law because the law has not kept up with these technological developments. So, is it possible, whether through law or literature or ethics, that we can fill in the gaps that the law has not been able to sufficiently keep up with in order to protect against these types of mass surveillance harms? Um, and um, I will conclude there because I know that the next speaker will be talking about ethics. And I thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you today. Abrogada. Thank you so much. Uh, muito obrigado. Uh, eu acho que a Margaret conseguiu trazer uma série de questões que nos fazem pensar sobre o tema que a gente pensou para essas palestras de abertura, que é o futuro do processo penal nesse novo mundo uh, de dados, de big data e com essas infinitas possibilidades uh, de tratamento de dados para uh, identificar suspeitos, né, como a Margaret muito bem falou. Eu queria então passar a palavra é, para a Caterina Radimateu, uh, que vai uh, abordar o mesmo tema, mas a partir uh, não só da perspectiva do Reino Unido, mas também da filosofia, que é a área de estudo dela. Então, com a palavra, Caterina. Muito obrigado. Uh, especially to Dennis and Natalie for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a fantastic honor to be here 
and um, thank you also, Margaret, for that chilling insight into uh, US practice at the moment. So, uh, as Dennis mentioned, my background is not in law, it's in philosophy, please forgive me. Um, I know we're in a law school, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best to keep it relevant and uh, philosophical, but not too philosophical. Um, so I'm going to be talking about surveillance, trust, and the presumption of innocence today. And I'm going to be doing something. I'll fill in. I'm going to be addressing um, one main question, and that is, do security surveillance practices undermine the presumption of innocence? So the answer to that question is going to depend on two things. What do I mean by security surveillance practices? And what do I mean by the presumption of innocence? And that second question is where the philosophy comes into it. Now, for what do I mean by security surveillance practices? What I'm going to be talking about today are routine, suspicionless kinds of surveillance that tend to be untargeted. So I'm not talking about surveillance that is done to a specific individual, a targeted individual, as a result of a crime or some evidence. I'm talking about things like open street CCTV. I'm talking about things like preventive monitoring and vetting. I'm talking about things like the use of large live databases, like for example in the UK we have a database that checks every number plate through uh, smart cameras as they come in and out and through cities. So it's this kind of mass surveillance uh, that is done without a basis for suspicion that I'm interested in. And I'm interested in the implications for the presumption of innocence. Now why am I interested in this question in particular? It's not a question that has occupied philosophers working in legal philosophy and moral philosophy, which is my own background, very much in recent years. Um, in contrast, people like me who are interested in surveillance issues have tended to focus on the impact on privacy, and more recently, other values like equality, social justice, accountability, democratic values like transparency. The presumption of innocence hasn't been a central topic until recently, but it is emerging as an area of concern, not only in philosophical circles, but also in public debate. There's a concern that this increasing monitoring of people is doing something insidious to our fundamental civil liberties, that in a sense, we're being required to bear the burden of proof of our innocence rather than that burden being as it should be on the state, or that in some way we're being treated as presumptively suspicious. And it's that intuition and also philosophical argument that I'm going to be trying to articulate in this talk, and then what I'm going to do is criticise it and examine it, uh, scrutinise it critically. So um, what I'm going to do, my outline slide isn't here, but I'll do it for you anyway. I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to give you an account of the presumption of innocence and how surveillance might undermine it. And then I'm going to reject that account and say why I find it not convincing. Then I'm going to propose an alternative account. And then I'm going to reflect a bit on what this tells us about surveillance and the presumption of innocence. And I should also say right now that I'm looking at one value, and that's the presumption of innocence. I'm not looking at surveillance and whether it's justified, all things considered. I'm not considering privacy, I'm not considering equality, and lots of other things. I'm just interested in that, that one value. So my arguments, and they will be arguments, are not about the overall question of is surveillance justified morally or not. Just to put that caveat in place now. Okay, so I'm going to start with a, a, a true life crime story because they always work quite well to fix our ideas. And this is a story you won't have heard about here, but it was a very, very uh, shocking and notorious uh, child murder case in the UK 
uh, um, um, over a decade ago now. So in, in 2005, these two girls, Holly and Jessica, who were 10 years old, went missing. They went missing from their homes one afternoon. And it emerged after a few days that they had been murdered by the caretaker who worked at their school. This caretaker, Ian Huntley, had become a friend of many of the children in the school and had invited the girls into his house and eventually murdered them. Uh, now, there was a great shock, obviously, about somebody with such a position of trust uh, uh, in relation to children doing such an awful thing. And the shock got worse and worse when it emerged that Huntley was known to the police. He'd been known to the police for many years. He had been convicted of sexual offences and he was known as a repeat predator, including of children. Now, this information was known to the police where Huntley used to live, but when Huntley moved to Soham, where he committed these murders, there was no way for the police to share this information with the local police. They didn't know he was moving, there was no information system where this information could be shared automatically. It would have meant calling up, finding out or calling up the local police, and that was never done. So the school and the local police had no idea that a quite notorious sexual predator was living and working in their community. Clearly there was a public outcry as a result of this. How is it possible in the internet age that police can't share information about known dangerous individuals? And there was a UK response. The UK response took a number of forms, one of which was to set up a police database that could cover the whole of the UK. The, the UK, you may not know, uh, is regionally organised when it comes to policing. So there are 43 different forces who before 2005 just didn't share any information. Now they have one central database as a result of this case. But another initiative on the part of the government was to set up, and it's not showing properly on these slides, but it's a, it's a system where anybody who wants to work with vulnerable people, by vulnerable, the system means children, elderly people, people with learning dis disabilities or uh, mental health issues, and prisoners. Anyone wanting to work in a voluntary capacity or in a paid capacity with people in this group has to undergo vetting. And the vetting is simple. You do an application, or the school does it for you, the care home does it for you, where you're going to work. And it checks if you have a history of offences against vulnerable people, of relevant offences. And on the basis of that checking, you are then allowed to work in the school or not. I have been through the system twice myself because I volunteer in my children's school. Now, you might find it surprising, but there was a boycott of this preventive vetting system. In fact, it met with some quite strong opposition from a group of children's authors, very high profile children's authors, who had been going into schools for years and volunteering with children and were suddenly required to undergo vetting. So I'm going to read you a quote from one of the, the author. He's quite famous, I guess, here in Brazil as well. He wrote The Golden Compass and the series that came after that. Um, and his argument against this vetting system appeals directly to the presumption of innocence in, I think, an interesting way. So I'll read it for you. He said, I refuse to be complicit in any scheme that assumes my guilt. The idea that I need to be vetted is both ludicrous and insulting. It assumes that the default position of one human being to another is predatory rather than <laughs> kindness, and that the basic mode is not of trust, but suspicion. It corrupts a child's view of the world. It teaches children that they should regard every adult as a potential murderer or rapist, and it's corrosive and poisonous to every kind of healthy social interaction. So, Pullman's argument here actually contains two quite distinct points. The first is a point about his right to be presumed innocent being violated. He's appealing to a moral right that's been, he's, when he says insult, he's been treated without the respect and dignity that he deserves. Why? Because he's being assumed 
to be guilty and has to prove his innocence. That's his first claim. It's about the moral right to be presumed innocent of an individual. The second claim is not about a moral right. It's about what this kind of system does to the relations between human beings and society, what it does to the social fabric of society, we might say. And he says, when you're asking people to prove themselves, when you're saying, you come here and I can't take your intentions at face value, I can't trust them, I must always double check, I must always scrutinize, I must always look behind, I must always be suspicious. This is teaching children and indeed everybody that humans can't trust each other. And that's a bad thing because trust is really important for society. So I'm going to think about both of these claims and what follows, but I'm going to focus mainly on the first one. I'm going to focus mainly on the claim that preventive monitoring and surveillance <coughs> in general um, violates people's rights to be assumed, to be presumed innocent. And I'm going to be bringing some philosophy into it now, so let's move on. Okay. So the idea that this right is connected to the legal presumption of innocence, and, and the idea is that they are connected, is expressed uh, by De Angelis here. The idea is that just as people brought to court are presumed innocent of the crime until they're proven guilty, so people out and about in society should be presumed innocent of bad intentions until they're proven to have them. And this intuition has been theorized recently by two legal theorists, one of them quite a while ago, and another who has um, revamped the approach, that's Anthony Duff. And that's, uh, they put forward a theory of the principle of civility or civic trust. And this is a moral principle that they argue should govern our interpersonal relations in society. And it gives rise to rights and duties to be treated, a right to be treated as trustworthy, and a duty to treat others as trustworthy. And, and in their own words, the theorists say, we must treat people as presumptively trustworthy in order to accord them dignity associated with the status of membership in the community that's governed by the norms whose breach is at issue. So in other words, we all agree we're governed by norms against crime, for example. And if I treat you as if you are presumptively criminal, then I'm disrespecting your agency, your morality, your dignity, and your autonomy. And as Duff says, we must respect each other as agents who can recognize and guide actions by appropriate reasons for action. All this means is that I shouldn't treat you as if you've got bad intentions when I've got no evidence that you do. On the contrary, until I have evidence of your bad intentions, I should treat you as if you have good intentions. That's just what it means for me to respect you as a moral agent. Okay. Close to my point. Sorry. So I actually, um, I actually think that this account of the presumption of innocence is wrong and mistaken, and now I'm going to explain why. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to raise three problems with the account. The first is that it's based on fallacious reasoning about the nature of trust. The second is that it gives a mistaken interpretation of the message that surveillance practices communicate when it says that they necessarily communicate mistrust. And also, it, this argument taken against surveillance has very unintuitive implications for other kinds of se security practices that most of us are just fine with. Okay, so what's this problem of fallacy I talk about? So the argument that we either treat people as trustworthy or as untrustworthy, when Philip Pullman says, when you ask me to open up my history to you, when you ask me to undergo a check, you're treating me as untrustworthy, I say that's a mistake, because it assumes that we've only got two kinds of trust-related attitudes, when we trust someone or when we mistrust them. And that's just not what trust is like. You can trust someone, you can trust someone a bit, you can trust someone a lot. You can trust someone sometimes and not other times. You can say, I don't know whether I trust them or not because I just have no, I have no knowledge of this person. So to assume that if I say to you, I don't know you, maybe you can give me a reference, that saying, I don't trust you, I think just misunderstands the nature of trust. We have lots of different trust-related attitudes, some of which are mistrust, 
some of which are trust and some of which lie in between. So there's a fallacy there. I think there's a better account than that account, and this is actually put forward not by a philosopher, but a, a sociologist. And this sociologist says, we've got trust, and what is trust? Trust is when I can take a risk with somebody. What does that mean? For example, I need somebody to look after my kids, yeah, so I employ a nanny, and I trust her to look after my kids. I, if I trust her to look after my kids, it means I'm not going to be next to her the whole time holding her hand. I'm not going to have a surveillance camera. I'm going to take some kind of a risk. I'm going to leave her alone. That's what trust is. Mistrust would be just not giving her the kids at all. But then there are in-between stages. And one of them is vigilance. That's where I'm not sure yet if I trust somebody entirely. So I'm going to ask them to give me some kind of assurance. In the case of the nanny, it might be that initially you say, look, I'm going to need some references from, from people you've worked for before. Before I trust you with my children, I'm going to need some assurance. Over the years, I'll, I'll trust you anyway, I'll feel more confident. That takes time to build up. You need to create a track record with me where I know you, I've seen what you do, and then we can build trust together. Does surveillance potentially do something like this? Maybe, I think. Let's move on. Okay, the second problem with the criticism that Philip Pullman put forward and which the civic trust argument supports is that I think it mistakes the message that's communicated by surveillance in every case. What it says is that every time CCTV cameras are put up, that's because people are not being trusted. It means that every time you walk under that su surveillance camera, the message communicated to you by the state is, you are suspicious. I just don't think that's always the case. Let's take airport security, for example. Why is it that we all have to undergo such irritating, I think we can all agree, irritating security measures at an airport? Is it because we are all assumed to be criminals? Is it because we're all mistrusted and everyone who travels by plane is in some sense suspicious because they want to travel by plane? I think no. Security practices at airports, the kind of ones we all undergo, you know, just the x-rays, it's not an implication that we're all terrorists or that we're all going to bring knives on an airplane and try and kill each other with them. What it communicates is flying is a risky activity. We want to do it together. We're going to do that. We need to show each other in some sense, that we can be trusted to get on a plane together. Otherwise, no one's going to fly. So that's one message that's communicated. For example, in that context, that's not all about mistrust. Sure, we don't trust each other entirely, because we don't know each other. But that's not the same as saying we actively mistrust each other. And I think the, the same thing goes for preventive monitoring of people who work with children. Children are very vulnerable, as are old people. Harm to children can ruin their lives forever. We have a duty of care towards children, and we know that a lot of people have abused that duty of care. Now, when I ask a particular person to undergo vetting because they want to work with children, it's not because I think that they're a child rapist. It's because I think children's safety matters a lot. There are some people that might want to abuse that position. I don't know who those people are and who those people are, but I think it's worth doing some checks and protecting the security of children. For me, that's not the same as saying everyone who wants to work with children is considered a potential rapist or murderer. A third implication that I think is deeply problematic and just wrong is that if we say that every measure of surveillance, every measure where we ask people to perhaps provide some evidence or we have CCTV cameras up, communicates mistrust and undermines the presumption of innocence as a result, then we're going to be saying that about lots of other things. For example, why do we have punishments? We don't need punishments necessarily with crimes. We could just, if someone commits a crime, just give them a criminal record. Why do we need to punish them as well? Well, it's deterrence. We think some people might need to be deterred. And that's assuming that some people are going to have bad intentions. Some people are going to have bad intentions. Is that insulting to humanity? To say it, if we agree with what Philip Pullman said and what these claims of surveillance scholars say, then we have to say that deterrence is also undermining the presumption of innocence. Just try and look at this quote. 
Mass surveillance promotes the view that everybody is untrustworthy. If we're gathering data on people all the time on the basis that they might do something wrong, this is promoting the view that as citizens we cannot be trusted. It casts a shadow of mistrust or suspicion over populations. Okay, well let's just replace the words gathering data on people all the time with threatening people with legal punishment. We're threatening people with legal punishment all the time. It implies they can't be trusted to obey the laws without that threat. So if we're going to say that surveillance practices undermine the presumption of innocence in objectionable ways, we're going to be saying that about lots of other things we do too. Okay, so there are some conclusions I think we can draw right now. One of them is that there just isn't a moral principle of, of civic trust or the presumption of innocence that says we all have to all treat each other as trustworthy or well-intentioned when we don't have that evidence of untrustworthiness. I just don't think we owe that to each other. Sure, we owe it to each other not to treat each other as criminals or as untrustworthy, but that doesn't mean I have to trust every single person I meet. Interim conclusion two is that Philip Pullman was wrong to be insulted by the requirement to be vetted. His moral rights to be presumed innocent aren't violated, and that's because there's no implication that he is personally criminal or ill-intentioned. When he's asked to undergo that vetting, it's not because he in particular is being singled out as criminal. It's the same treatment for everybody who wants to engage in this risky activity with vulnerable people. So I, I just think he was mistaken. So, I've argued that we shouldn't have a civic trust interpretation of the presumption of innocence. I've argued that that's not going to explain to us when and how surveillance might undermine the presumption of innocence. We need another explanation of the presumption of innocence and in a, in a moral way and how surveillance might undermine it. And I think this is a good candidate. Also put forward by legal philosophers, but different ones. And this is the interpretation of the presumption of innocence as a protection against wrongful criminalization. We can see some immediate contrasts here with the last interpretation. One, this is not a moral principle of interpersonal relations. It's not about the way I treat you and the way that you treat me as citizens. It's about criminalization, and there's only one agency that can do that, and that's the state. It's about the harms to individuals of being criminalized by the state. Those are very serious harms, and they're harms that one individual cannot inflict on the other. So here the presumption of innocence is limited to the sphere of criminal justice. So the main claim that we can deduce from this interpretation, the wrongful criminalization interpretation of the presumption of innocence is this. Surveillance practices that criminalize people in the absence of sufficient evidence of criminality, they violate the presumption of innocence. Those, but only those kinds of activities, surveillance activities, violate the presumption of innocence. So this argument implies only to interferences with liberty, I'm talking about surveillance that interferes with liberty, so that could be your privacy, or it could be, uh, it could be your um, freedom of expression or something. So these arguments apply only to interferences with liberty that are done in the name of an implied criminality. Why am I saying that? Because this is helping us to see it's important the message that's communicated. There are lots of different reasons why we might survey, uh, why the state might survey people, or even why in the workplace people might be surveyed. Only some of these are done in the name of an implied criminality. I'm doing this to you because I think you might be a criminal. That's what we're interested in. And the argument applies to all criminalizing activities by the state, not just convictions. Because we criminalize people when we convict them, but we also criminalize them when we arrest them, when we stop and search them, when we paint them as criminal or stigmatize them as criminal in the eyes of the other, when the police pick people out from lines in front of other people and ask them to, to um, hand over their goods and so on. There are lots of different ways in which the state can criminalize people. And when these are done, these criminalizing activities are done without sufficient evidence, that undermines the presumption of innocence, in my opinion. So, what kind of conclusions can we draw about the sort of surveillance practices that do undermine the presumption of innocence? I've argued that preventive vetting of people who want to work with children 
doesn't undermine the presumption of innocence. I've also argued that things like CCTV, open street CCTV that's untargeted, doesn't undermine the presumption of innocence. You might want to object to it for other reasons. There might be other things that are wrong with it, yeah? But I'm saying it's not a presumption of innocence violation. However, there are kinds of surveillance that I think we can quite clearly say do undermine the presumption of innocence by criminalizing people wrongfully. One example is given by the East German secret police known as the Stasi. Are people familiar with the Stasi here and what they did back in, back in the, the, the 1930s and so on? Uh, sorry, the 1940s and so on. So the East German secret police, their methodology was to treat everybody as a criminal, basically. Everybody was, or most people, were subjected to very intrusive kinds of surveillance in the total absence of any evidence of criminal wrongdoing. Wiretaps in people's homes, neighbours spying on people, just as a routine activity, targeted intrusive surveillance with no evidence. That undermines the presumption of innocence. That casts a shadow of suspicion over everybody in society. That is poisonous to trust, trust relations in a society because it makes everybody suspicious of everybody else. There we have a good example. Another more recent and relevant example is facial recognition. Facial recognition, as I'm sure many of you know, is not equally effective scientifically. Firstly, it's not particularly effective anyway, but even within that, it's more effective when it comes to identifying correctly certain kinds of um, ethnic and racial features than other kinds of ethnic and racial features. And that's a problem, because if it means that I, as a woman, perhaps of a certain look, am more likely to be singled out by police at a protest, or at a celebration, or at a march, and asked to open up my bag and, and turn out my pockets, and that happens to me regularly. That's a criminalizing activity. And if you're criminalizing me because I happen to fall within the group that your facial recognition technology can't distinguish between different individuals for, then I think that's, an under, that's undermining my, my right to be presumed innocent. And we can also make similar claims about racial profiling by police as well. Final thoughts. My presentation was called Surveillance Trust and the presumption of innocence. Now I've talked a little bit about trust, but it hasn't been central to my arguments. However, I do think that we can take away some important messages about the implications of surveillance for trust in society. <coughs> and that seems to me to be that the better our surveillance is, the more total it is, the less room it gives for people to break norms and laws undetected so the closer we get to a perfect enforcement or a total surveillance, and, and who knows whether we are going that way, some people think we are, I think that will be really problematic for trust in a number of ways. And why is that? It's because I won't have any need for trust anymore. If I know that you can't break the law without being caught out because of your mobile phone, because of of the smart cities data that tells me where you've been and where, because of the smart uh, meters data in your home, because of the constant total surveillance, I'm pretty confident that you're going to abide by the norms. I don't know whether you would have abided by those norms, whether you're the good, right kind of person that would have respected those norms anyway, right? Because you don't have the freedom to break the rules. How do I know whether you're the sort of person that would break them or not? I can't, I can't judge whether you're trustworthy. And what that means is that it also removes people's opportunities to become trustworthy. If there's no risk in the way we interact with each other, how, how can we build genuine relations of trust? And I think that's a real problem because trust is very, very important and it makes societies resilient. It makes us resilient because it means we don't need surveillance to be able to get on with each other and get the job done and cooperate together. We don't need it because we've got enough trust between us. If the state is doing all the, getting all the assurances for us, it means we don't have the opportunities to build that trust. And it means we become totally reliant on the state 
and, their, and its surveillance capacity to feel confident in going about our daily business and for our security. And I think that is a really quite chilling and scary thought. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Agradecer é, muitíssimo a professora Caterina, é, que acho que é, nos obrigou aqui a pensar com bastante rigor sobre esse conceito que é tão recorrente é, na nossa cabeça. Quando a gente começa a estudar é, processo penal, acho que é a primeira, uma das primeiras coisas que a gente pensa e fala e começa a discutir, mas acho que é, é extremamente importante pensar nesse conceito com esse rigor que a Caterina propõe, né? até porque isso nos permite diferenciar é, e justificar uma série de práticas e é, ter outras como é, inaceitáveis. Né? E eu acho que é, essa reflexão que a Caterina trouxe dialoga muito bem com os exemplos e as questões que a Margaret colocou a respeito de como o Estado americano uh, tem olhado para essas questões. Né? Eu teria uma série de perguntas e colocações, mas eu prefiro abrir uh, para o debate e ouvi-los primeiro. Então, uh, eu proporia que a gente uh, uh, recebesse duas perguntas, aí uh, as duas respondem, em seguida mais duas, etc. Só para não ficar uma pergunta e duas respostas, uma pergunta né, para ser mais lenta. Então, uh, quem tiver perguntas, fique muito à vontade. Uh, as perguntas podem ser feitas em português. A gente tem a tradução simultânea aqui. Uh, não fiquem tímidos. Uh, e, enfim, convido a todos para a gente ter um debate antes do coquetel. Quem tem perguntas? Temos uma pergunta lá no fundo. Uh, o microfone, uh, a gente vai levar o microfone até vocês. E eu peço que vocês uh, se apresentem brevemente, digam o nome uh, e de onde é, antes de fazer a pergunta, uh, para que a gente tenha o registro. E a pergunta é importante que ela seja feita no microfone, porque a gente está gravando. Então depois a gente fica com o registro do que foi perguntado também. Mais alguma questão? Aqui, um. Boa noite, eu sou o Edgar Siqueira. Eu queria fazer uma pergunta junto com uma proposição no sentido de que hoje no Brasil, ainda mais com essa mudança legal, você tem o direito reativo, né? você tem que acionar o direito para que ele possa ser estabelecido como seu direito próprio, quando já deveria ser estabelecido dentro do regimento legal. E quando a gente não tem, por exemplo, pessoas que são realmente, a gente está buscando isso dentro dessa formação, mais qualificadas para lidar com essa contemporaneidade, por exemplo, em defensoria pública, ou o acesso é muito restrito ainda a esses tribunais nessa forma de entendimento do direito. Como que isso está sendo entendido no âmbito internacional com a política, por exemplo, da questão do trabalho, da política de utilização de dados para funcionários, para vieses que extrapolam, por exemplo, a função de carreira ou exercício, né? como, por exemplo, a gente pode ter um, uma série de entendimentos, desde o trabalho qualificado dentro de casa, por exemplo, quando as pessoas elas têm o extrapolo, o limite de carga horária de trabalho, quanto também essa privacidade, essa vigilância, ela é a privacidade quebrada e a vigilância é inserida em contexto que extrapola a questão do regimento que tem contrato de trabalho com a empresa. 
como que isso também lá está sendo visto, né? A gente tem casos no Brasil em que pessoas que fazem algumas ações fora do ambiente do trabalho refletem diretamente no trabalho, pessoas que levam muito trabalho para casa e extrapola a questão contratual. E a gente não tem hoje, porque até quando a reforma trabalhista você tem que acionar né, você fazer uma questão de acionar o um direito para que você possa tratar diretamente e isso também como que é visto da forma não só civil trabalhista mas como a questão penal como trabalho escravo e outras atribuições que também exerceram esse entendimento legal tá. é, vamos fazer então uma rodada de respostas eu vou recapitular basicamente as perguntas acrescentando talvez algum Uh, comentário uh, meu, seu detupar, detupar muitas perguntas, por favor, me interpelem. Mas a primeira pergunta, basicamente, eu tinha resumido já aqui, basicamente é sobre a, essa figura do garantidor e como que ela se relaciona com essa ideia de confiança. E a segunda pergunta, eu queria é, pegar um pouco carona uh, na pergunta, uh, comentário, e perguntar um pouco como... Uh, tanto nos Estados Unidos quanto no Reino Unido, o direito responde ou quais são esses mecanismos ou instituições que atuam na defesa quando, seja a presunção de inocência tal como você definiu, é violada. Então, como é, quais são as instituições ou como é que as pessoas conseguem é, responder a essas violações? E nos Estados Unidos também, não só nesse exemplo é, que você deu, Margaret, é, em relação a, ao travel ban, Uh, mas uh, há alguma articulação em relação a como se defender dessas violações uh, promovidas pelo, uh, pelo governo americano? Quais são as principais instituições que estão envolvidas nessa defesa? Né? Se são uh, defensores públicos, se são a necessidade de contratar advogados privados, etc. Como, quais são os instrumentos que o direito oferece pra, como resposta para remediar ou para reagir uh, a essas situações? Thank you for your question. That was weird. Um, uh, I, I, I guess the question is uh, the question was framed as as relating to the USA. But I can't speak for the USA because I'm from the UK, so maybe Margaret could answer. But in in the UK, um, it is common now for for uh, private employees. So I have had a nanny, and they have this check. Um, if they, they come to me with a certificate uh, of a clear record uh, and that's now it's now expected by by people even private employers like somebody having money in their house or a babysitter yeah, in, in the United States a lot of caretakers uh, are screened through uh, a company and my employer for example conducted a criminal background check on me and also a, a credit check on my financial record before clearing me for employment. I think that that's very common. So um, how does the law try to protect the presumption of innocence? Um, well, there's the criminal um, um, procedural protections embedded within the US Constitution. So you have um, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Seventh, Eighth. There's multiple amendments that protect against um, self-incrimination, the right to trial by your jury of peers, um, that you um, are protected from double jeopardy. There's, there's not an explicit protection of innocence in the text of the US Constitution itself. And so the presumption of innocence is more protected as a principle of our um, criminal procedure. Um, but for example, you had asked about the travel ban and what kind of legal remedies were available. The case did go all the way to the Supreme Court and there were multiple legal theories that were brought into the courtroom um, by those trying to challenge it. Um, under the First Amendment, freedom of religion, um, uh, freedom against the establishment of religion. Um, you had um, equal protection protect, uh, clause alleged. You had um, anti-discrimination laws. Um, you had Administrative Procedure Act um, as one of the um, avenues of trying to challenge it. 
that the um, Trump administration had violated administrative procedure, had violated um, immigration laws. So there were multiple ways in which to try to bring it into the court. Um, but by the time it reached the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of the United States held that it could proceed basically under the justification of national security. And that also feeds into the theory of the surveillance state. The national surveillance state depends on a justification of protection and security. And that the surveillance is justified as a state action, that it is not perceived as necessarily even surveillance, that it is perceived just as a way to help govern a citizenry and protect them. Temos mais, temos uma pergunta ali uh, e uma pergunta lá atrás. Boa noite, meu nome é Maria Luísa, eu sou do Rio de Janeiro, trabalho na Fundação de Cidadania Interfrente e gostaria de perguntar, na verdade, relacionada ao setor privado, né? quais são os mecanismos de transparência, de accountability, como é que você consegue barrar processos de empresas que inclusive estão a favor do setor público também, fazendo essa coleta de dados e talvez revendendo com perfis para gerar uma tendência, né? e a gente sabe que isso acontece principalmente politicamente, partidariamente, que é acontecido muito, tanto nos Estados Unidos quanto no Brasil, é, no Brexit também aconteceu um bocado, e em termos da Constituição, né, dos direitos fundamentais, do, do que está baseado nos princípios é, das cartas jurídicas que vocês têm, se existe algum mecanismo, né, se existe também algum tipo de argumentação contrária a, esse, a, a esses direitos que estão sendo infringidos sobre a argumentação também constitucional, se existe uma contrapartida propositória contra o que está acontecendo hoje, não só nos Estados Unidos e na, na Inglaterra, mas também é, se alguém também estiver trabalhando nisso em relação ao Brasil. Tem uma pergunta ali atrás. É, boa noite, meu nome é Letícia. É, eu gostaria de fazer uma pergunta mais para a Margaret. É, você, no começo da, da sua apresentação, falou que o governo usa justificativa de que eu vou fazer tudo aquilo que nenhuma lei me proíbe de fazer. Então, eu queria saber como você analisa o contexto, principalmente dos Estados Unidos, mas se o professor quiser falar um pouco do Brasil também, se teria a possibilidade de, às vezes, passar uma lei que efetivamente proíbe essas práticas. Porque, por exemplo, a gente teve recentemente todo um interrogatório com, no Congresso americano contra o, o Facebook para saber sobre isso, de pegar dados e vender para empresas. Então, já teria um movimento ali, mas se você sente que Alguma lei nesse sentido de proibição de coleta de dados para esse, esse objetivo aconteceria em algum futuro próximo ou se não é o caso ainda, como que você vê isso? Obrigada. Uh, thank you for both of those questions. Um, so, the first question about, and, and they're very interrelated, um, but the first question um, about the um, potential laws um, that um, could be passed um, to protect data. The European Union has now the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, and it requires things such as transparency that you need to be able to um, understand at a human level the algorithms or the machine learning artificial intelligence systems that are being used against you. There's limitations on storage. Um, there's um, a process in order to access the data. And here in Brazil, because you have the right in your constitution um, to your data, um, you have a constitutional method and a constitutional norm that we don't have in the United States. And I think it could be very powerful. Um, I think that, um, you know, shifting more to your question, you know, what could be done into the future. I think that in thinking about constitutions, we need to think not only about the way that the constitutions protect us as individuals and individual liberties and rights, 
But we need to think about how a constitution can protect society as a whole from that surveillance because surveillance harms are harms against humanity, harms against society. In the Brazilian constitution, it appears that you have more text that recognizes that than the US constitution. That your constitutional language itself protects society-wide rights. In the United States, many of the rights that are protected are focused on the individual, but surveillance <coughs> harms have to be seen as larger harms, more systemic wide harms. So I think that constitutions need to grow in their ambition in order to encompass that. I think that there probably needs to be an amendment to constitutions to protect our digital selves and our cyber identities. Um, as well as our individual selves, our human flesh and blood selves are protected under constitutions. But what about our cyber personas? What about the digital self that is be cre being created by our data? Um, I think that potentially constitutional rights need to be extended in that way. And I think that we also need to, going to both of your questions, think about these harms as international human rights harms. Because the ways in which these mass surveillance technologies are operating are transnational. They operate across borders. They don't recognize any borders. And so constitutions, whether it's the Constitution of Brazil or the Constitution of the United States, they are very specific to geography. But that's not how these harms operate. And so without some type of international treaty um, without committing ourselves to some type of human rights norms that prevent surveillance and protect dignity and autonomy from the surveillance, I don't think that we can really stop the corporations because the corporations, all the economic incentives are for the data and, and people say very commonly now data is the new oil or data is the new currency that that it's all dependent on data. Our new digital economy and our information society is dependent on data. Or Shoshana Zuboff, her book on surveillance capitalism, that capitalism itself is dependent on surveillance and the exploitation of our data. And that will take a lot of reforms, potentially beyond legal reforms. Just to add very briefly to that, there was a question about the, the law and what's being done in the vacuum. And I think facial recognition is an interesting case because in the UK, for example, there is no legal regulation of facial recognition and the companies have rushed in to provide police forces uh, with facial recognition technologies that are currently being trialled in the UK. And there, there is a backlash. Uh, against the use of facial recognition and I, I wouldn't want to predict anything but there is at least a possibility I think that there will be uh, there will actually be a stop on the use of facial recognition by police and I think the EU is showing itself to be a, a leader in, in with respect to these kinds of things and we may see in the future there also law and regulation actually not saying you can survey but it has to be like this and proportionate and, but saying actually this method is just just disproportionate in itself and, and should not be used eh, antes de passar para as outras perguntas eu queria só também uh, comentar rapidamente acho que complementando uh, o que a Margaret estava comentando acho que há uma diferença Uh, fundamental que a gente deve ter em mente quando a gente compara uh, o, o modelo regulatório ou a, a Constituição dos Estados Unidos com a Constituição do Brasil, a que a Marta fez referência algumas vezes, uh, nos Estados Unidos a Constituição basicamente coloca garantias contra uh, o poder do Estado, né? ela não se aplica então ao setor privado, que é mais ou menos o que você estava perguntando. E aí o modelo regulatório dos Estados Unidos em relação à proteção ao direito à privacidade, no caso do setor privado, uh, se vale muito da atuação do FTC, uh, que olha para isso a partir de uma ótica consumerista, né, um órgão de proteção à concorrência ao consumidor, uh, e está baseado muito numa ideia de uh, uh, 
a ciência e escolha. Né? Então, se eu uh, sou transparente a respeito das práticas que eu uh, tenho e se as pessoas consentem com elas, uh, então não há problema. Né? Então, em relação ao setor privado, de fato, nos Estados Unidos, uh, o modelo é substancialmente diferente. Na nossa Constituição, como ela não se aplica apenas em relação ao Estado e a nossa Constituição garante a privacidade, teoricamente a gente teria é, um ferramental é, maior para lidar com essas questões. É, não foi à toa que no Brasil, no ano passado, foi aprovada a Lei Geral de Proteção de Dados, que entra em vigor no ano que vem e que endereça, de fato, muitas dessas questões em relação ao setor privado. Mas vale lembrar que muitas discussões que a gente vai ter aqui, elas estão ah, fora do âmbito de aplicação da LGPD. A LGPD não se aplica ah, para o caso de segurança pública e defesa nacional. Né? Então, acho que ah, daí porque a importância de pensar um pouco nesses conceitos, nessas garantias do processo penal ah, típicas e aplicáveis a essas situações. E aí, antes de também ah, ouvir as próximas perguntas, eu queria fazer uma pergunta ah, e aí, isso eu acho que está conectado uh, uh, com os outros painéis uh, do, do Congresso. É, a Caterina propôs que a gente pensasse um pouco sobre a presunção de inocência a partir da ideia de wrongful uh, criminalization. Né? E aí, a minha pergunta, a provocação seria como identificar que essa criminalização ela foi errônea, uh, dada essa vasta gama de provas potencialmente científicas e, portanto, uh, comumente associadas a serem muito precisas. Né? Então, uh, quando você falou, você usou uh, o exemplo da, da reconhecimento, do reconhecimento facial, que há uma série de estudos mostrando uh, como a eficiência é diferente, por exemplo, para pessoas brancas e pessoas negras, uh, mas isso acontece com uh, uma série de outros tipos de prova, né? Uh, provas de DNA, por exemplo, que podem ser mal coletadas, podem ser contaminadas, podem não provar determinadas coisas, com imagens de câmeras de televisão, uh, enfim, há uma série de questões que podem surgir no uso e, é, é, desse tipo de prova, que podem dar a ideia de que essa criminalização foi correta, mas na verdade ela foi errônea. Né? Como lidar um pouco ah, com essas questões a partir dessa ideia de que seria isso que a presunção de inocência protegeria? E aí acho que a gente pode pegar mais uma pergunta. Tinha uma aqui é... e depois ah, lá no fundo. Acho que como eu fiz uma pergunta, a gente pega essa e depois a gente começa a próxima rodada ali com o Arthur. Boa noite, meu nome é Márcia, eu sou advogada, eu trabalho com compliance e investigação. E o meu questionamento foi que uh, a Margarete falou muito sobre, antigamente era, existia o crime e depois com as provas, com o que coletavam e atrás da pessoa. E atualmente é, tem os dados e aí vai atrás das pessoas. E eu vejo... É, pelo, pelo tudo que está acontecendo no Brasil, principalmente nos últimos tempos e pelo que a gente anda estudando, é, onde que está a segurança, onde que eu, eu posso enxergar que há uma segurança, porque nós temos legislações, temos um certo, é uma, uma regulação bem fechada, mas ao mesmo tempo você, a gente fica é, é, vendo que não é tão assim, tão, os órgãos que oficialmente são tão independentes não são tão independentes. Então, o meu questionamento é assim, como que em um momento que a gente está passando por um, um, alguns questionamentos de como é, há um atravessamento do, de, de órgãos entre uns e outros, como que a gente pode se sentir seguro se quem que está seguro, na verdade, se, se dados estão sendo pulverizados e é, no Brasil a gente sabe que se a gente faz essa Santa Efigênia tem dado de todo mundo, é, como que a gente pode se sentir seguro nesse momento pensando que aonde a gente poderia confiar que seria confiar né? que seria os, as, o regulamento que seria a nossa legislação que nos protege e que não que na verdade há um certo é, cruzamento desses dados sem um mandado judicial simplesmente por por uma certa podemos dizer não sei se a gente pode dizer mas uma perseguição é, de acordo com o que cada um acredita, cada um, principalmente na política. E, e é isso. É, o meu questionamento foi mais para levantar isso, porque em um mundo bonito brasileiro, a gente tem uma regulação 
que determina cada passo que pode ser feito e, na verdade, na, no mundo real não está sendo feito assim tão seguindo a ordem judicial. Obrigado. É, acho que é, essa é uma das razões pelas quais esse congresso é importante. Né? Acho que algumas dessas questões estão, sim, já de certa maneira, escondidas pela nossa legislação, e outras não. Né? E acho que a grande parte dos debates desse congresso tentam pensar quais são as garantias é, aplicáveis a esse novo contexto. Né? Quais são a, as balizas que devem ser utilizadas a, com essas novas tecnologias e com essas novas práticas de vigilância que surgem. Mas, com isso, eu passo a palavra para a Margaret e para a Caterina, em relação às perguntas. A dela é a minha. Thank you for your question. I'm amazed that you actually ask a philosopher how we can do anything in the practical world. Because uh, that's much harder to answer than trying to, you know, define what the presumption of innocence is. But no, I, I would say that in many cases, in many kinds of violations of due process, are hidden and are very, very difficult to identify. Last night we were talking about cases in which. Um, there is exonerating data that could quite easily uh, be accessed by police. For example, CCTV data or mobile phone data that would clearly exonerate a suspect, but the suspect doesn't know that the police are obliged to, to look for that data and the police can't be bothered to look for that data. And uh, in the UK, one thing I'm seeing in, in my conversations with police is is that they're, they're not seeking the full range of data they should seek because they don't have the data analysis skills and they don't have the resources. And as a result, people are being wrongfully criminalized or people are giving false confessions because they don't realize that the data that would exonerate them is available and that in fact the police have a legal duty to find it. So I think there are many cases in which people are being wrongfully criminalized for a range of reasons. We can talk about also police misconduct or corruption uh, that doesn't come to light and that we can only try to render more visible by, for example, creating laws that, that would, I think personally, that facial recognition as it stands right now undermines the, the presumption of innocence as it's being used in the UK, and I think it should be stopped at least for that reason. So I think in, in some cases it's the technology and its application in general that is a prima facie violation, but in others it's going to be improving procedures slowly, step by step, transparency, accountability, and, and trying to identify things those ways. And I think the first step is we hang on to our humanity, and we remember how we came to have constitutional rights in the first place, and that's based on a philosophy of rights, of inalienable rights, of natural law, that by being a human being, we have rights. And I think the more we fight for that humanity, the closer we're going to get to having the law match the philosophy. So the first step, I think, is the humanity and the philosophy and the ethics. The second thing I think we need to do is interrogate the science. I think that there's a lot of presumptions about the accuracy and the precision of the science, then we don't interrogate it enough. And so that goes to um, the making sure that we ensure that the system of justice and our criminal procedure systems and our national security protocols are subjected to the most rigorous scientific standards. We can't just presume because it's technologically advanced that it's also accurate in its prediction. The third thing I think we need to do is ensure that we continue to extend those rights and protections that we enjoy in a small data world into the big data world that we're now about to inhabit. So due process under the law, what does that look like in a small data world? How can we guarantee that we still have due process under the law in a big data world? Equal protection under the law, what does that mean under a small data world? How can we ensure that we still have that? in a big data world. And then the final thing that I think you need to do is impose structures that restrict power. And in the US government, for the US Constitution, they try to divide up power horizontally and vertically. They try to divide up power 
so that it wasn't housed too centralized in one specific place. Right now, we're about to enter a century where most of the power is being housed by corporations. The corporations that drive these technologies have as much power as nation states in many instances. And we need to find legal methods to break up that power. Temos ali duas perguntas. Nós temos quatro. É, cinco. É, vamos começar ali pelo Arthur uh, e uh, em seguida uh, o Bruno, acho que tinha uma pergunta, e vocês dois. Então vamos fazer Arthur, Bruno e você, e depois vocês dois. Tá? Só para ficar E aí são as cinco perguntas finais para a gente encerrar. É, boa noite, obrigado. As palestras, as palestras foram. É, Adorei. É, eu sou Arthur Péricles, eu é, sou estudante de doutorado aqui na faculdade. Eu tenho uma pergunta para a professora Rachi Matão. É, ela comentou um pouco ali no final sobre estruturas que impedem a criação de confiança. E é, eu queria saber a sua opinião sobre a discussão que tem agora sobre é, Responsible Encryption, é, a criação de backdoors em, em, em aplicativos de, de mensagem. É, e se isso se relaciona com essa ideia é, que você apontou ali no final da, da sua da palestra. Obrigado. Boa noite. Primeiro, parabéns a todas pela, pelas falas. A minha pergunta vai para a professora Caterina também, em relação um pouco ao que o Denis já levantou sobre as criminalizações errôneas ou equivocadas. É, de acordo com a sua fala, os problemas em relação à presunção de inocência seria justamente quando essa vigilância acaba ou é, termina em criminalizações equivocadas ou em condenações erradas. É, analisando esse cenário a partir do que a professora Margaret colocou, é, quer dizer, no mundo em que o Big Data está sendo usado de forma massiva para coletar informações, e também, tanto no Brasil, nos Estados Unidos ou na União Europeia, em que as legislações criminais estão cada vez mais se expandindo para englobar um número maior de condutas e voltadas para movimentos populares, para movimentos enfim, sociais, de uma forma geral, se o problema não passa, além das criminalizações equivocadas, para as criminalizações em si, uma vez que essas criminalizações são resultado de uma política que, pela sua própria natureza, já faz com que elas sejam questionáveis, né? se isso não se respeita também enfim, a crise do Estado Democrático de Direito, outras questões, mas é meio por aí a pergunta. Olá, meu nome é Jéssica, é, muito obrigada pela exposição. Acho que deu uma boa inquietação, assim, em nós, por mais falo por mim, estudante de Direito, para que a gente possa estar precisando ainda mais de, 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 sobre o tema. Eu queria saber como que tanto o povo americano é, tem enfrentado essa coleta de dados, como eles têm reagido, e na Academia do Direito, é, se já tem algumas propostas práticas para barrar o argumento de que a segurança nacional ela prevalece. Obrigado. Então, uh, Caterina e Margaret, depois a gente faz as duas perguntas finais e depois a gente vai para o coquetel e aí vocês podem ter oportunidade também de, uh, eventualmente, uh, conversar um pouco com a Caterina e com a Margaret. Thank you. Um, so the first question, as I understand it, is about how is encryption going to be viewed or how is it being viewed in this context and I, I'm assuming that what you're getting at is is encryption sufficient basis for suspicion so the fact that somebody encrypts their data that's not what you were getting at no sorry I meant the rhetoric about uh, safe spaces and uh, the argument that there shouldn't be uh, uh, strong encryption that hinders police, police officers from accessing uh, information on suspects Yes, okay, so um, in the UK and 
I do talk to, although I'm, I'm an academic, obviously, I also have a role with our national crime agency, which is the, our, our equivalent of the FBI in the UK, um, with respect to data ethics issues. So I do talk to police quite a lot about it. And encryption, although I'm aware, is, is a very hot topic here, is not a big concern of police in the UK. And that's A, because it's, it's very difficult for police to get content anyway. The number of authorizations for surveillance of content data are very small in the UK. It's, it's only possible to get it if it's a very, very serious crime. Uh, and if, if it's approved by a judge and so on, it's a lengthy process. So the majority of policing, they don't even bother trying to get the content. They go for the metadata, uh, which they are very good at analysing and which they can get a lot of value from and which is easier to get in terms of authorisations. I also think that the fact that police find ways of hacking phones and getting physically phones addresses the challenge of encryption in the UK. And I do also think they, for very serious cases, there's a lot of collaboration between our intelligence technology arm, which is called GCHQ, and uh, our FBI, the National Crime Agency, to decrypt uh, things. And I think process, progress is being made in that field. So encryption is no longer the issue it once was. In response to the second question, um, which I think, I, maybe I misunderstood this one too, but I think refers to what, what I was talking about things that sh people shouldn't be, things that should be criminal, but people are being wrongly criminalized for. And you're asking me about things that shouldn't even be criminal in the first place, like certain kinds of political activity. Yes, I think I think this is a real this is a real concern. This is not a philosophical concern because there's not a philosophical debate to be had about it. It's quite clear that people should be free to participate in democratic politics without fear of criminalisation because there's nothing criminal about doing democracy. And I think that it's another kind of wrongful criminalisation when people are criminalised for expressing their political views or for organising a political meeting. It's a, different, it's a different kind of wrongful. It's not erroneous, it's morally wrong because that's something that shouldn't be criminalised. And I, I, I have very little to say about it philosophically apart from that it's quite obviously morally wrong. About your question about in the United States, there's um, active debates on practical legal reforms. There are, and many scholars um, there are looking to whether there could be more of a legislative approach, something like the GDPR, something like what um, you know the Brazil has passed um, for data protection, um, or strengthening agencies such as the Federal Trade Commission. The FTC, you might have seen um, in the headlines this summer, assessed a $5 billion fine mm. against Facebook um, in light of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So ideas of whether or not there needs to be greater regulatory responses. But a lot of these companies are proposing self-regulation, that they themselves can regulate themselves. And they are trying very hard to lobby against any other type of regulatory or legal regime to guide them. And so that is truly a challenge in the US legal system. Obrigado. Eu vou uh, pedir desculpas e fazer uma sugestão que as duas últimas perguntas vocês façam durante o coquetel. É, porque a gente está realmente em cima do horário uh, e todo mundo que, especialmente quem pacientemente esperou de pé assistindo as palestras, acho que a gente pode agora Uh, aproveitar o coquetel e aí todo mundo tem a oportunidade de conversar tanto com a Margaret quanto com a Catarina e eu gostaria de encerrar agradecendo muito a presença das duas que vieram de longe uh, no meio das férias de verão uh, para falar aqui com a gente foi excelente e uh, muito obrigado